Jacob? How are you? Good. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk. Yes. How's your weather That's in super- San Diego today? Um, you know, it's kind of like embarrassing to say, but it's not good. It's very gray and drizzly. But, uh, you know, San Diego, May gray, June gloom. So that's what it is. It's true. It is true. All right. So to get started, I'm just going to read kind of your bio so that folks know about you. And then I'm going to start, you know, peppering you with questions. So Jacob Sapochnik is originally from Israel and he moved to the U.S. to pursue his LLM in international and comparative law. His goal was to complete his studies, find a job, and advance in his career. He found a job with a mid-sized law firm and started his American dream, but he soon realized that having a legal job was not like in the movies. He worked hard, but his salary was capped. He had to bill hours, work weekends, and witness how clients should not be treated. He knew he could do it differently, and so in 2004, he took the plunge. All he had was his two-year-old Dell computer, a scratched glass desk, and a small back room rented from a fellow attorney. Since then, he has built a large immigration law practice serving hundreds of clients. His practice publishes two legal blogs. The first one is visalawyerblog.com and was established in 2006. They also run a YouTube channel um, and run a mini publishing arm at the law office to support their media outreach. They have been using innovative social media practices to make it happen. They have built the largest Facebook community for lawyers in the U.S. with more than 150,000 fans and real engagement at facebook.com slash myimmigrationlawyer and continue to innovate in that area. They keep doing it month after month. Their method works and their enchanting marketing system keeps them steadily moving in the right direction. Okay, Jacob, tell me, tell me your story. How did you get here with, with those things on your wall? Oh yeah, of course you can see that. <laughs> so um, you know, we talked before, and um, um, I'm kind of like in my legal space right now. But I, um, I always liked. Uh, I think I'm a, an entrepreneur in my in my heart, and and law was just happened to be the business that I was in because I, that's what I studied. So I came to the United States to um, I wanted to to really be part of the internet bubble, which was in late the late 90s so I came here in 98 and, and my dream was to become to um, to specialize in internet law copyrights uh, Napster I was working with mp3.com which was based in San Diego mm-hmm. and in other um, related companies just doing my research for my thesis and uh, when I graduated the, the bubble burst right so there were really no jobs for people like me and and I realized also that it's gonna be very difficult to you know, get a job or, um, you know, do what I really want because I realize it's not the glamour that you read about. It's really contracts and boring paperwork. So I ended up working for a small firm that did international law and they were helping physicians with their asset protection. But what is interesting is that now it opened the door to this international business. Now people are coming in, different languages, flying all over the world. The attorneys are helping them. So I like that. But then after a year, I realized that like to be a lawyer. I mean, I, I enjoy the law and I, I, I like the skill, but what I like more is the business of law. Hmm. And so, soon there, sooner after I quit the law firm and I started my own law firm, and I, like I told you before, I really had no clients the first six months. I didn't want to to um, use the yellow pages. I really, I really wanted to try to be a different kind of lawyer. And I just had my first baby, and I was like really struggling because I'm like, I really have to do. And I tried to conform, and I tried to put an ad, and I got people, and I, and I wasn't happy. And I was sitting in a coffee shop, uh, and, and we're here in San Diego. It's the heart of the marketing world. And it was an internet marketer sitting next to me, and he was doing something, and we ended up chatting, and he said, you know what you should do? You should, you should start a blog. And I'm like, what, what? What is a blog? And he said, well, you can write about this. And, uh, and I kind of started researching this, and I did start my own first um, blog. It was on um, TypePad, or one of those mm-hmm. early. And again, like I told you before, I had no clients. I, you know, I was pretending that I'm working, so I was typing in my blog all these articles. The phone was there, and it was ringing. I was like, "If you saw the, if you saw um, 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 Cole Soul, the, the the spinoff of Breaking Bad, uh-huh. where he's sitting." Sure. And he's checking his mail and zero messages, and that was that was me. Every day I check my phone, zero messages. 
So anyway, three months I'm blogging, and then one day I get a call on that phone, and I answer the phone, it's like, Fox News, maybe speak to Jacob. And I'm like, Jacob? Oh, it's probably a mistake. Man. Yeah, this is Jacob. And then well, we want to interview you on the news because there's a new change in the law, and we need you to be with the experts, or we need you like, and they've been saying, like, I'm the expert. I'm three months in my practice. I have no clients, and I'm the expert. How did you find me? Well, we've been reading your blog. And I was like, Boom. like time freezes and kind of the light, you know, and I started to, so, you know, I did the interview and, um, and I, um, and I started to do more things on the blog. I used keywords, I started researching more and more and more phone calls came and people were, um, you know, people were, um, were finding me on the web uh, because of my blog and Slowly the practice started growing. I had to hire my first paralegal. So blogging was really kind of like, I realized the power of being uh, on social, kind of like talking to more people than just in your immediate facility. So then we started using uh, YouTube videos because everybody, you know, lawyers started to blog. So I wasn't the only lawyer who was blogging. And um, so I started doing videos on YouTube and then, you know, we started getting clients from YouTube because what the premise was give away for free, give, 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 and then only ask. So I was giving away all this, how to do this, how to do this, and I was getting phone calls from attorneys and saying, stop doing those videos, you're telling everybody how to do it, you're a traitor, you're this and that. And it became hard because people, the attorneys in the community were kind of starting to, you know, not like me. And, and um, But then, I believe it was 2010, and I met Mari Smith, who is a Facebook marketing uh, uh, guru. And I attended a few of her events, and I realized through attending her events, the power of social media, not just Facebook. What happens when you become, when you use the power of social proof, being more than you are, giving away content, uh, uh, educating people, and not asking anything until, kind of like we call this a backdoor marketing. Hmm. You don't ask anything, they come to you, okay? Hmm. And so that happened, and Facebook became a tool, and I've been using it as an amazing tool to grow my practice. We, um, um, in April 2015, I posted this ridiculous photo of a, la of a, of a slide and um, I said, you know, will you, will you go down the slide, yes or no? Most of my content was more inspirational and engaging, less legal. On the second day when I woke up, the post had 100,000 likes and 250 shares, 1,000 shares. Wait, explain the, the post again exactly. What was it? So for, for people who are interested, you can Google um, lawyer beats Coca-Cola on a slide. Okay. It was just a slide. Oh, it, it's the largest water slide from Brazil. Okay. I believe. Okay. And I just said, okay. you go down on this slide, yes or no. Because huh. back back huh. then, the idea was to engage your audience huh. by asking them questions. Right. You know, all this PT, PTP, people talking about it. Mm -hmm. You know, Facebook doesn't have that anymore, but that was the measure back then. So I wanted to engage the you know, people to talk about my page. And I only had maybe 80,000 fans back then. Okay, only. So, somehow it went viral. I have no idea why. Huh. Um, and viral to the point where um, you know, somebody wrote about it, like a, 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 you know, a media a news news reporter, and he determined that we had more people talking about our page and during that week than of all of Coca-Cola, the company, with more than 7 million uh, uh, fans. That's amazing. That's such a good marketing story. Wow. So they, you know, they practice, and you had a lot more fans. But what happened is that, I, what I realized is that it's not enough to just get leads. What is, what is important is to build an environment. And again, I was not thinking as a lawyer anymore. I was more of a business owner. Like, how can I, how can I free myself from the practice? Because then we discovered that my child had a muscle dystrophy, and I really needed to stop working 12 hours a day mm -hmm. and be home by three so I can spend time with my daughter. So I can also leave for the summer for two months so I can take them to Israel with my family so they can help me with the kids. Um, so I had to find a way. So. One day I was sitting in the office and I'm thinking, by then I had about 12 people working for me. I'm like, how can I make them continue working without me being in the office? So my assistant came to the office and she said, listen, we're thinking about changing the carpet downstairs and we think um, blue would be a nice color. So we wanted you to say, fine, do it, whatever you want. And then the next day she came back and say, well, did you realize that the trash cans in the back are blocking the parking? I think we should put a barrier and put a notice there saying, let's go ahead and do it. And then I told her, listen, 
Grace, you, you have the authority to do whatever is reasonable, and I trust okay. you, and I gave her the credit card. Hmm. As soon as I handed her the credit card, something has shifted in this person. Wow. Because she realized I value her huh. to the point where I trust her with the money. And so what happened is that not only she was more efficient with the expenses of the office, but she was telling other people to stop wasting the toilet paper in the toilet, hmm. which I would never tell anybody. You know what I mean? Hmm. So the idea is what happens when you empower your employees hmm. to make decisions, to treat them as equals, and make them understand that they don't just work for you, yeah. but they work with you. They work yeah. with you because without them, you really have no business. Right. And so we started investing in our employees, send them to um, uh, educational events, I spend time with them one on one, telling them what I feel, and sharing my my uh, my uh, personal opinions with them about the office. And now it became kind of like a family. So the first time I left for two months, I didn't call the office for a week, and I was freaking out. I was like, "Oh my God, what's going to happen?" When I returned from that vacation, not only were we making more money, but they hired a new person without telling me. And that person is working there to this day, and she's amazing. Hmm. And so we call this the enchanting way because for two reasons. For one, one reason is because it is very important to be nice, no matter what you do. And even though your personality, I, I mean, in my case, I'm a nice person by nature. I feel like I am, and sometimes too nice. But the idea behind it is that you have to be nice to people because if you're not, there's no way they're going to do what you want them to do. Hmm. And the second thing, it creates an environment of trust beyond what you can ask anybody to do. I don't ask people to stay at the office until midnight. Yet every time I pass the office, and I'm in downtown San Diego, just to get an idea, we're like two blocks from the gas lamp. And sometimes when I go out in the weekend with my friends, and, and, um, and you know, I pass by my office, and there's light, and it's 11 p.m., and people are working. And when I look back at the cameras, I see who they are. I don't ask them to do that, but they do it because they feel committed to the clients. And there's no way you can ask people to do that. You can't force them to do it. Hmm. So the idea is, the enchanting way, the principle is that you have to be nice and kind first. You have to be there for your employees when they need you. For example, one of my employees was about to uh, get divorced, is, is getting divorced, and she has a very, very um, hard divorce process. The husband is not giving her money, it's a whole thing. She's not able to pay her rent, and he, she's not even able to pay the filing fees of divorce. Now, they know they can come to me, and when they tell me that, they know I will help them, and we do. And so the point is that you're not just working in the place of employment, it is also a place where you can come to your peers and they can help you no matter what it is. Hmm. Because you're not, so the idea is that they know that if I need them, they'll be there for me. So it's kind of like a get back and forth. And the same with the clients. You know, When the clients are here, we treat them in a certain way that they bring the referrals, they, actually, they drive the referrals to the office. That's how dedicated, we call them zombie loyalists because they will defend <laughs> We have the highest reviews in the city of San Diego. We have like 170 something reviews. The next attorney, we have maybe 30. Mm. And there's a reason for it because the clients really feel that they need to tell the story of the experience that they get at the office. You know, mm. so that was the thing that I did. But then I realized that I lost the passion of doing what I, what I love, which is which is managing the legal space. And so I realized that some people, in my case, it's me. I need to be involved in a few things to be able to draw inspiration and bring it to what I'm doing. So in my case, my main thing is the legal space. Mm -hmm. I started a coffee shop. It was my passion. But I also believe that the coffee shop brings me inspiration and stories that I can bring back to the law firm and continue being inspired to do what I do. Right? And so we started Simon Says two years ago. Okay, so let's stop for a second. You started a coffee shop. You have probably dozens of employees. You're an immigration lawyer. What's, okay, and you, you have way too much work on your hands. You spend two months so here in Israel, you get home at 3 p.m., and then you decide to start a coffee shop. Let's, let's right. hear more about this. Coffee. It's called Simon Says. Uh-huh. It's a place where people inspire. This is the cup. Every day we have an inspiration cup. Okay. And so what it is that people are very lonely in, in big cities like San Diego. And so they sit in Starbucks. They don't talk to anybody. And we decided to create a space where people can come to the bar. It's a small coffee bar. And the barista will say, hey, Claire, what's your name? I mean, hey, what's your name? I'm Claire. Where are you from? Meet uh, Rosie. She's uh, working here. They make connections, and they want to stop people from being sad and depressed because the number one reason for people getting, uh, you know, committing suicide is because they're lonely. Mm-hmm. And so we have a lot of people come there who live in downtown. They don't have anybody else to talk to. They just come and sit in the coffee shop, and they sit on the bar, and they talk. You know, we have 
at least 11 couples they met on the bar, just sitting there, and the barista will say, hey, Jill, this is David, he's single. I think you guys can connect. Wow. Uh, I think so. But for me, sometimes I'll meet clients there because I want to take them away from the legal environment, hmm. take them to the coffee shop so they can feel less, and we create some interesting information. So, so the coffee shop kind of helped me kind of decrease the stress and, and do this. But I realized that by having a second business in a way, it also gave me a challenge of, can I do this again? Because I, I built a successful law firm, I have employees, I'm starting from zero, I have no, I have no understanding of the, of the food business, I never owned a food business, can I do this again? Can I, impl- can I apply the enchanting system in a coffee shop? Mm-hmm. And it's working, because everybody who's working there, I tell them, you're not just there getting 12 bucks an hour as a barista, you're more than that. Mm-hmm. You are an officer of happiness. Mm-hmm. Every single, because remember, the person who's sitting here at the bar could be thinking about taking their life tonight. Yeah, yeah. Don't have a conversation and tra- you know, get out of there with the system, what isn't there, you'll be responsible for this happening. So you need to open your eyes. And so the coffee shop was kind of like, you know. And then a year ago, um, I always believed that you have to follow your gut, you have to act immediately, and kind of like the five-second rule. Have you heard of the five-second rule? Her name is Mel, um, it's a TED Talk. She says, you have an idea, if you don't act on it within five seconds, you never act on it. So for example, you sit in, the, in, a, in, a, in a party, and, you, and there's a girl and you want to ask her, you want to invite her to dance. So you're about to, to get out of your chair, and then you have the dance. She's too beautiful, she's not gonna wanna dance with me, mm. she's gonna reject me, I'm not a good dancer, and you sit back on your chair. Mm. Five minutes, Pass, you're not going to do it. It's gone forever. Wow. I had one of my clients who wanted to start a company, a startup, and they cannot get an office space because they have no credit. Mm-hmm. And the guys, I want to know what to do. And I said, I'll find you a space. So I went and I found the space and I would negotiate the lease and all that. And he got a space. I'm like, you know what? Why not create a space like this for entrepreneurs where they can come and work without credit, no matter where in the world, just to an issue. So a year ago, we started a co-working space called Community. Wow. It's called Community in San Diego, and you can Google it. It's called C-O hyphen M-M-U. I'll send you all the links so you can share them. And Community is the first co-working space in the United States that has an international door. What does it mean? It means that you can be sitting in Argentina right now, yeah. and you have a dream to start working in San Diego on Thursday. Yeah. You sign up website. We we get you the space reserved for you on Thursday. You You, you come on your flight. You can show up and, you can, and, the, and the community manager will say, hey, Claire, in addition to space, what else do you need? Do you need an accountant? Do you need a lawyer? Uh, do you need this? By the time you arrive to San Diego, everything is ready for you. Wow. So the is supposed to connect entrepreneurs all over the world. And we're starting a program called Global Camp, where we're going to bring people for two weeks to spend two weeks in San Diego and live in one house and experience startup life the way we do. It's kind of my new project. That's so, so they, cool. I had this in my, in my I, I dreamed about it at night, I woke up in the morning, da, 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 da. business plan was ready in two days, and community launched a year ago, and now we're opening a second location in San Diego. But the idea is that, what I'm trying to say is that the, the barriers for innovation are, there, there are none. As long as you are doing things the right way, the, I call it the, the enchanting way, by being, being, giving away value and being a good person, Everything kind of lines up, aligns, right? Wow. If you can. I love it. So can you tell people what you're really focused on these days and where folks can find more about you? Sure. So I'm really focused on um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the areas that I found has not been disrupted is the professional uh, services, which is you know, legal, accounting. There's not enough innovation there. And the new co-working space we're opening, which is uh, another branch of community, is going to be community law. Oh. We're going to create a special hub for attorneys who are thinking in a very creative way about the future. How to have a practice that works for you. How to use technology. We're going to have live streaming studio. We're going to have a podcasting studio. Content creation. Wow. Uh, with AI, virtual reality. Uh, all that kind of stuff I'm going to have in that space. And we're going to use it as a lab to create a course a six-week course for attorneys who want to take their space from this point to what I've done in this practice. 
Um, as I said, I have built my practice in less than three years. I mean, of course, over the years, I had it now for 13 years, and of right. course, it's much bigger. But after three years, I had enough revenue mm -hmm. to really have a life that I didn't need to worry about money anymore. Hmm. Because I had enough income so I can take my summer vacation. I had enough income to, to buy my house. Um, you know, I mean, the things that you need, you don't need to be a super millionaire. You just need enough stuff to be able to do what you want mm -hmm. and enjoy your life. It's not, I, I believe that you, people who chase after endless money, they're never happy anyway, yeah. right? And, and I have a lot of, I mean, we have clients who are billionaires. And, 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 I, and I, one, of my, one of these clients, actually, I flew, you know, he flew me to Europe last year to help him get a visa for one of his, one of his kids. And I, and I spent uh, uh, four days with them, and you know, billionaires, and they have more money than five generations of their family could ever, I mean. And the issue is that you feel that there is no true happiness there. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that they're very nice people, but you know, the, the, the constant pursuit of something that is, is not there is never gonna end, right? Like you, you have you know, five billion and you want two more. Right, and you're gonna buy. You're gonna build another housing development. You're gonna purchase another factory and fire everybody. And why would you need to do that? Because that's what you're accustomed to, you know. Hmm. And so I feel true, true happiness in my mind is where you are able to not worry about where your next paycheck is gonna come. You're able to spend time with the people who really matter to you in life, and you're able to help others who need your help every single time, right? And so I think that. And the final component is to have an amazingly beautiful girlfriend. But you know, that's a you know, side note, right? Ice cream. That's right. Just... Icing on the cake. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, this is the key. The key is that, again, the enchanting way, which I bring it again here, is that if you're truly not a nice person, like trying to be nice or, or helpful, it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. Like it's never going to be like a horrible boss and you're going to feel bad about it in five, ten years. Which, you know, being nice doesn't mean you have to be uh, uh, um, somebody to take advantage of. It means that you're trying to be, you know, certain way. If somebody doesn't respect it, then you cut them off or whatever you have to do. But really try to make an effort. Say, you know what? I want to shake your hand first, right? That kind of mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, first. What are we gonna do together, right? So people can find me at enchantinglawyer.com, mm -hmm. which is my marketing blog. And my legal blog is h1b.biz, which is our law firm. But Enchanting is going to have a lot of content. I'm going to launch the course over there. And, um, you know, they can find me on Twitter at, at visalawyerblog.com. And at visalawyerblog. That's, that's the handle. I guess you're going to have links. We're going to have links. Thanks so yeah, much, thanks. Jacob. This was super, super great. Thank you so much for, for being here and chatting. I really appreciate it. Have a beautiful, amazing day. You too.